How to read Shakespeare like an Oxfordian. The best part of learning about Oxfordianism is applying it to Shakespeare's masterpieces. These plays and poems have been displaced from their context for 400 years, and with acceptance of Oxfordianism on the rise, one hopes that they can finally begin the long journey home. Consider that nearly half of Shakespeare's plays are almost never produced, denigrated by puzzled Stratfordians as problem plays. Stratfordianism is the problem, not the plays. These problem plays tend to be those hewn most closely to Edward de Vere's personal experiences and the political events of the late 1500s, and through an Oxfordian lens, one discovers these hidden gems to be some of Shakespeare's most heartfelt and technically virtuosic works. Let's dive in. The second scene of Merchant of Venice features a long exchange between Lady Portia and her lady-in-waiting that is quite often perplexing to modern audiences. Portia's deceased father decreed before his death that she could not choose her own husband, but rather had to submit to a convoluted process by which suitors could win her hand through solving a riddle involving gold, silver, and lead caskets. Oxfordian scholarship notes the allegorical parallels between Portia's dilemma and that of Queen Elizabeth, whose deceased father, Henry VIII, decreed before his death that Elizabeth could not get married unless her husband was approved by a privy council of Henry's government ministers. The gold, silver, and lead caskets are reminiscent of the three crowns worn by England's monarchs in the 16th century, gold, silver, and iron, representing the kingdoms of France, Ireland, and England. As Portia and her maid go through the long list, mocking Portia's royal suitors, a modern-day reader armed only with mainstream scholarship might have the feeling of being on the wrong end of an inside joke. But to an Elizabethan courtier of 1579, these detailed caricatures would have been provocative satires of powerful people, any of whom might be the next king of England. The bland Monsieur Le Bon is clearly a satire of the French Duc d'Alençon, nicknamed Monsieur, who overstayed his welcome at the Elizabethan court as a suitor for her hand in the late 1570s. A prince mocked for his romantic obsession with his horse reminds us of Sir Philip Sidney, whose love sonnet to his steed inspired guffaws amongst the aristocracy. Suddenly, this long scene is not just a random detour from the main plot. It's a royal episode of The Bachelorette. According to Stratfordian scholarship, Merchant of Venice was written in 1590, when Queen Elizabeth was almost 60 years old. How curious that this play should make so many detailed comedic references to the Queen's marriage prospects decades past their relevance even making fun of Philip Sidney, who by this date had perished tragically as a war hero. Stratfordian dating of Shakespeare's plays is largely derived from the work of historian E.K. Chambers, who by his own admission started with a man named Will of Stratford upon Avon's lifespan, and worked backwards to determine when the plays were written. Will of Stratford would have been about 14 years old, living in a rural hamlet during the years when Queen Elizabeth was associating with the gentleman referenced in this scene. It's hard to imagine that such a small-town teenager would have been privy to such scandalous royal gossip, or that he would have felt emboldened to roast any of Queen Elizabeth's boyfriends. Edward de Vere, on the other hand, was one of Queen Elizabeth's favorites during this period, and had a reputation for ruffling feathers. Celebrated for his charm at dancing, de Vere was called to turn a guylard before Monsieur d'Alençon and refused twice. Referring to de Vere in 1593, Gabriel Harvey wrote, all you that tender the preservation of your good names were best to please, for fear lest he be moved, or some one of his apes hired to make a play of you, and then is your credit quite undone for ever and ever. Such is the public reputation of their plays. Monsieur d'Alençon also shows up as Bottom, the buffoonish actor in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Mainstream scholarship has acknowledged for a long time that Titania, the fairy queen, is based on Elizabeth herself and Titania is essentially given a love potion that makes her fall in love with this ridiculous buffoon with a donkey head who keeps saying, Monsieur, Monsieur. When the Duke finally left, Elizabeth wrote a poem called On Monsieur's Departure. Interestingly, one of Alençon's French ambassadors was accused of mixing a love potion to ensorcel Queen Elizabeth. And there's a pun about Bottom wearing a French crown beard, which is a triple entendre. The French crown was a syphilis joke, and there were rumors that Alençon had syphilis because his face was pockmarked from smallpox. When Francis Flute says, I have a beard coming in. That's a reference to how one of the French ambassadors apologized for Alençon's bad skin, but said that he could cover it up by growing a beard. And another French ambassador was named Quincy, leading some to think that he's the model for stage manager, Peter Quince. Let's turn to Troilus and Cressida. This deep cut problem play is rarely performed as its sharp dramatic turns are too challenging for Stratfordians to follow. However, an Oxfordian lens reveals Troilus and Cressida to be one of Shakespeare's most deftly executed works, its unusual characteristics not bugs, but highly intentional features. Let's place Troilus and Cressida within its proper context and see if we can rescue it from its ill-deserved obscurity. Troilus and Cressida was a classic romance well known in Elizabethan England thanks to Chaucer's epic treatment of the Greek myth hundreds of years before. In many ways, Elizabethans thought of Troilus and Cressida the way that modern people might relate to Romeo and Juliet. 
It was the quintessential tale of star-crossed lovers. In 1580, 30-year-old Edward de Vere had a torrid affair with one of Queen Elizabeth's handmaidens, the witty and willful 20-year-old Anne Vavasour. Anne ended up getting pregnant, and both she and Edward de Vere were placed in the Tower of London by a royally pissed-off Elizabeth. Anne gave birth in prison and soon started a new love affair with her jailer, master of the armory Sir Henry Lee, much to the consternation of Edward de Vere. Troilus and Cressida sets de Vere and Anne Vavasour's chaotic love affair against the backdrop of the Trojan War, and de Vere presented this play at court as an apology to Queen Elizabeth for his indiscretions. Many have noted Shakespeare's unsympathetic and even misogynistic portrayal of Cressida in this play. That's because Shakespeare was doing everything he could to throw his ex-girlfriend under the bus in order to regain the good favor of his highly jealous monarch. Cressida swears eternal love to Troilus, only to capriciously shift her loyalties to her jailer after she's traded in a prisoner exchange. Stratfordian dramaturgs have twisted themselves into pretzels attempting to justify Cressida's whiplash-inducing change of heart. The reality is that she's unsympathetic by design because this is a hit piece. Another strange element of Troilus and Cressida is the overbearing presence of Pandarus, Cressida's creepy uncle who pretty much pimps Cressida out to Troilus. Pandarus is inappropriate and unlikable, and it's odd that Shakespeare gives this character so much stage time, even having him deliver the play's closing monologue. Anne was a teenager at the time of her introduction to court, and many of her introductions were made via her older cousins Henry Howard and Charles Arundel, who were at the time close friends of De Vere's. It was an open secret that male courtiers would often attempt to leverage their attractive female relations to gain power, and the Howard family was especially notorious for this strategy, having previously introduced King Henry VIII to another young cousin, the unfortunate Anne Boleyn. The character of Pandarus seems to be a composite of Henry Howard and Charles Arundel, who became de Vere's arch nemeses during the fallout from the Anne Vavasour affair. De Vere accused Howard and Arundel of plotting a Catholic conspiracy against the Queen, and Howard and Arundel retaliated by publishing a list of more than 70 libelous accusations against de Vere, ranging from pederasty and bestiality to necromancy and treason. Troilus and Cressida concludes with Pandarus speaking directly to the audience, promising to bequeath you my diseases. De Vere used the character of Pandarus to get the final word against his loathed rivals, all the while implying to the audience that he was the victim of a creepy uncle's lascivious setup. Troilus and Cressida features a large ensemble cast, with classical heroes such as Odysseus, Hector, Achilles, Agamemnon, and Helen of Troy each taking a spin across the boards. As you might have guessed, each of these characters is a stand-in for a figure in Elizabeth's court, and Shakespeare variously celebrates or derides them according to De Vere's alliances at the time. Beauty queen Helen of Troy is predictably a representation of Elizabeth, and Helen's teasing of Troilus over his chin whisker is a direct reference to flirtatious jokes that Elizabeth had made about De Vere's chin whisker. Achilles, far nastier in Shakespeare's telling than in Homer's, represents Sir Robert Dudley, Elizabeth's longtime favorite who looted De Vere's estates when they were placed in the crown's care. In Homer's Odyssey, Achilles is a great warrior who defeats Hector in combat, but in Shakespeare's version, Achilles commands his thugs to surround and take down Hector when he's alone and undefended. Achilles slash Dudley is portrayed not only as a villainous coward, but also as a homosexual, spending many decadent hours in his tent with Patroclus, a stand-in for Dudley's nephew, the poet Philip Sidney. Today, much of this context has been lost, and with it, the snap, crackle, and pop of how it really felt to experience these plays in their earliest incarnations. Elizabeth relished in watching her nobleman competing for her favor, and attending a play at court could often feel like blood sport. Stratfordians will ask you to believe that Elizabethans had nothing better to do than watch quaint fairy tales about Italy or Bohemia. On the contrary, these allegorical entertainments provided courtiers with the opportunity to debate major political issues in front of their reigning monarch, and they had devastatingly real consequences. Finally, a major theme throughout Shakespeare's plays is the barge encouraging Queen Elizabeth that she needs to get married and have kids. The pressure on Elizabeth to get married wasn't just people being nosy. Having an unmarried queen was incredibly dangerous, A, because if she died without naming an heir, there was probably going to be a civil war, and B, because marriage was the best chance England had of forming an alliance with one of their more powerful neighbors to aid them in the power struggle against Catholic Spain. There are many characters in Shakespeare that are obvious stand-ins for Elizabeth. One example is the noble Olivia from Twelfth Night, who is refusing to get married. Viola says to her, "'Tis beauty truly blent, whose red and white nature's own sweet and cunning hand laid on. Lady, you are the cruelest she alive, if you will leave these graces to the grave and leave the world no copy." There's a famous line from Hamlet, "'The play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king.'" Edward de Vere was a lot like Hamlet, using his station as the queen's poet laureate to speak directly to his queen. This was an awesome privilege as well as a grave responsibility. And the truth is, much of what the world still celebrates as Elizabethan is due to the extraordinary manner in which Edward de Vere extolled the achievements of his monarch. There's a lot more plays to touch on, so I'll probably make a part two. 
Thanks to Earl Showerman, Michael Delahoyd, and Mark Anderson for their research. And thank you to the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship for their generous support.